Boo! Did I get you this time? How's it going everyone, it's Nate here. And Skyrim is a realm of magic, monsters, mages, mechanical giants, and so much more. Such really is true not only for Skyrim, but the entire Elder Scrolls universe in which it exists. And in a world of so much mystique, where what we back in real life would call paranormal is just straight up normal, you better believe Bethesda relished in the opportunity to pepper it with mysteries and unanswered questions to puzzle Skyrim's player base. And so, in today's video, we will be taking another deep dive into some of Skyrim's most fascinating inquiries. Sit back and relax for our 11th installment of Unsettling Mysteries in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Starting off, the members of the Inner Circle of Whiterun's Companions Guild are all plagued with a special power, or curse, lycanthropy, given to them by the Daedric God of the Hunt, Hercene. This enables members of the group to transform into werewolves, effectively on command. However, also means that upon their death, their souls will go to her scene rather than Sovngarde, or the typical glorious afterlife realms. The latter half of the Companions' questline is centered around the guild's effort to find a cure for this lycanthropy, so that when they die, they'll get to rest in peace, rather than be slaves to a dark Daedric Lord. After quite a climactic series of events, the guild will succeed in developing a ritual to relieve themselves of this curse, and each Inner Circle member will choose to do so. Well, all except Ayala the Huntress. Ayella, for her part, refuses to give up her power when given the chance to. She wants to remain part wolf, even if it means never getting to experience Sovngarde. It's never really explained why she makes such a seemingly outlandish decision. Most of us, myself included, probably just sort of assume that she must really like running around as a wolf or something. However, some players have theorized that there may be much more significant reasons behind Ayala's odd choice. You see, before we were able to cure lycanthropy, midway in the Companion's storyline, a lycanthrope member of the guild's inner circle, Skior, was killed in a surprise attack by the Silver Hand. The game heavily alludes to there having been a serious romantic relationship between Ayala and Skior. The two have some dialogue that implies that they hunt together, alone, frequently, and there's even a conversation Ayala may have where she denies rumors of the two being a couple. Since Skewer was killed before ridding himself of his curse, that means his soul went to her scene. Many suspect that because of this, Ayala's wants hers to go to her scene too, so that in the afterlife, she can finally be back with her old friend slash lover. She doesn't just enjoy being a werewolf that much or something, she wants to see someone again that she cared about. Perhaps her and Skior really had a deep connection, and she's willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that she gets a chance to interact with him again, even if it means captivity in her scene's realm. At least, that seems to be the most plausible potential explanation. Surely she doesn't think a few more years of werewolf powers is worth being trapped in oblivion for all of eternity. But hey, we've seen characters do sillier. Arnie Gain, I'm looking at you. Next on our list. Oh, I think you guys are really gonna like this one. Who were the Ice Tribes and what was the Gehenoth? So this mystery, while it certainly revolves around Skyrim, was one that we were introduced in a game that very much was not The Elder Scrolls V. You see, back in 2004, fresh off of their hit Elder Scrolls III Morrowind game, Bethesda Softworks decided to commission the release of two cell phone games. Mind you, this was back in 2004 long before touchscreen or the first iPhone were invented. People were literally playing these titles on their Motorola T720s. Well, one of those two games was called The Elder Scrolls Travels Dawnstar. It exclusively took place in the city of Dawnstar in Skyrim. The plot centered around an extremely shady and mysterious blue-skinned people, described simply as coming from the North, 
who had recently been raiding and threatening to capture the town. These enemies were referred to as the Ice Tribes, and the game would ultimately climax with the player, called the Hero of Dawnstar, ultimately driving them away and defeating their terrifying pet, an equally mysterious beast known as the Gehenoth. But who the heck were these people? Where are they really from, and are they completely gone in time for the events of The Elder Scrolls V? Well, apparently coming from the North, there's a few different regions these shadowy clans could be hailing from. A. At Mora, an entire frozen continent north of Tamriel that's said to be uninhabitable, but we have no real maps of. B. The Island of Solstheim, which is relatively northeast of Skyrim, or C. They could be from any of the innumerable frozen glaciers or icy islands in the Sea of Ghosts between Skyrim and Atmora. Again, we don't really know where Atmora is exactly or what it looks like, so we're not exactly sure how big the sea is between it and Skyrim. There's a lot of room for these people to be coming from. Furthermore, due in no small part to their blue skin, there's no shortage of theories and speculation about their ancestral origins. Many players attest they could be a relative of Reiklings, who also donned blue skin, and appeared in Morrowind as well as Skyrim's Dragonborn DLC. Though, these ice people are a good bit taller than we know Reiklings to be, making this a little unlikely. Others propose that perhaps they could be descendants of the Snow Elves, a thought to be extinct elven race that was wiped out by the Nords during their conquest of Skyrim thousands of years ago. We know that some Snow Elves avoided immediate death by seeking refuge with the Dwarves and eventually evolving into the Falmer. Maybe some instead chose to flee into the icy seas north of Skyrim and became whatever these are. But as persuasive as these arguments may be, neither of them explain away the Gehenoth, that terrifying monster who acts as a final boss, which is unlike anything in the entire Elder Scrolls universe. It's almost impossible to describe without showing you the picture. It's not a troll, it's not a giant, it's not a frost giant, it's not a hagraven, I don't know what this creature is. One idea I've taken a real liking to is that maybe these ice tribes and their monster friend here aren't really from the north at all, but instead the east, the far east, Akavir in particular. Akavir is of course the exotic and incredibly mysterious continent east of Tamriel. It's said that there's a people there known as the Kamal, or Snow Demons. We have no idea what those fellows looked like, but it stands to reason that maybe they're blue, and maybe they'd have exotic, demon-like pets. Though, we can't be sure if that's true either. Whatever these shady invaders were, wherever they came from, if they're still around somewhere, only they know, and... Maybe we should just be glad that they haven't come back. Coming in at number three, who exactly is the Ancient Dragonborn? Well, that's not an especially difficult question to answer. He's a spectral companion that can be summoned after the second word of the Dragon Aspect shout has been learned. But to be more specific, which Dragonborn is or was this ghostly fellow? Well, in the entire Elder Scrolls franchise, there's been a handful of Dragonborns. We know virtually every ruler in the entire Septim bloodline was one, which is like 20 people right off the bat there. Additionally, Skyrim's ancient High King Wolfarth, Alasia, Queen of Cyrodiil, and of course the player are a part of that list. So there's roughly 25 Dovakins the lore tells us of. And, in fact, it's possible there may have been just a couple others we never heard of sprinkled in. Though, likely not many, as two Dragonborns within the same lifespan isn't a thing that's supposed to happen very often. Okay, so at this point, our mystery of who the ancient Dragonborn is or was seems fairly unsolvable, right? There's just too many candidates. Well, there's a few things worth paying attention to 
that not only really narrow down the pool, but complicate this thing a whole lot further. We learn the Dragon Aspect Shout, which allows us to call upon this character during the events of the Dragonborn DLC. While the expansion's main plot doesn't directly say it, the power is very much connected to Mirak. The Dragon Aspect Shout, of course, has three words a part of it. They're found on word walls within Ravenrock Mine, Mirak's Temple, and Apocrypha, respectively. Like all other word walls, each of these have some text written in Dovazul, basically dragon language, inscribed onto them. And, when translated, they say a lot about the first Dragonborn. The first of the Dragon Aspect word walls reads as follows, quote, All praise glorious Mirak, most powerful servant of all dragon priests, whose strength was granted by the gardener of mankind. The second goes, quote, here once stood Mirak, who wore his faith as armor, shielded by Daedra for his eternal loyalty. And the last wall states, quote, This stone commemorates great Mirak, dragon priest of great wisdom, servant of the dragon kind, and enemy of mankind. So clearly, Mirak has something to do with this power, right? In some way, he must be associated. Well, it gets even weirder. Because if we use the Dragon Aspect shout on him during our final showdown and call upon the Ancient Dragonborn, he'll say this. So, you use my own shout against me. You learn quickly. His power? He's implying that he himself had something to do with the very creation of this shout. Yet, at the same time, we know that Mirak was the first Dragonborn. So, how could he have anything to do with summoning Ancient Ones before him to his side? It's also worth noting that the Ancient Dragonborn also uses a spectral variant of the Ancient Nord hero Warax. This can be important for two reasons. One, Nord hero weapons can only be crafted at the Skyforge in Whiterun, possibly implying the wielder must be from Skyrim, and it's a Nord weapon making it unlikely to have been wielded by a Septim Dragonborn. Then again, that could also just be a design choice by Bethesda. Some have taken all of this information collectively to possibly suggest that this character is an aspect of Mirak himself. Rather than being the whole spirit of a long-dead Dovakin, could this simply be a part of Mirak's own soul? Or maybe there was a Dragonborn prior to him? It's unlikely we'll ever find answers, at least not anytime soon. Whoever he was, the ancient dragonborn, is a nice, if rather mysterious, ally to have at our backs. For fourth spot, who was, or what is, the greedy man? So yet again we're going to be focusing on the dragonborn DLC. Here, the Skull Nords of Solstheim will give the player a fairly comprehensive introduction to their unique religion. Unlike their Nord brothers back on Skyrim, they don't worship the Nine, or Eight, Divines. Instead, they believe in a single monotheistic god, known as the Allmaker, who's said to have created pretty much everything. What they don't directly tell you, but a few in-game books in both Skyrim and Morrowind's Blood Moon DLC reveal, is that the Skull also believe the Allmaker has a sort of evil counterpart that they call the Greedy Man. There's a few other names this being is referred to as, including the Adversary and the Antithesis. Additionally, it's stated that there's a more proper name for this entity that it prefers to be called by, but no one dare speak or write it down, so we don't actually know what that name is. According to legend, the Greedy Man is equally as powerful as the Allmaker, and delights in upsetting his work. He's responsible for famine, drought, and ultimately death all being natural occurrences, which long ago apparently wasn't the case. At first, it's fairly easy to write off the entire Skull religion as nonsense. I mean, throughout the events of Skyrim, we constantly interact with the myriad of real gods. So clearly the Skull have it wrong, right? 
Well, not exactly. The Allmaker stones, large, well, stones scattered across Solstheim with a deep connection to the Skull religion, harbor real, genuine power, as do their shamans and priests, which are constantly interacting with their god. So, there's something here. In one of their legends, the Skull claimed that the greedy man manifested himself in a physical form once, and infiltrated one of their tribes, before revealing himself, doing all sorts of nasty things, and then fleeing off into the woods. This is actually the subject of the book, Avr Stonesinger. The Dragonborn DLC somewhat hints at the possibility this greedy man could really be Mirak, or Hermaeus Mora. Both characters would have obviously been around long before the Skull, and Mirak personally has an obsession with corrupting the Allmaker Stones, so you could see why people think of him as an adversary to their god. Furthermore, other players are of the opinion that it could be Lorcan, or an aspect of Sithis. Lorcan is a very evil and also very powerful being that isn't touched upon much in Skyrim, but in Morrowind in previous games was a pretty big deal. Imagine an evil god a lot more powerful than the Daedra, and that's kind of the spark notes of what Lorcan is. He's got a lot of significance with the creation of the universe and everything. So, he's another good candidate. What's so striking about all of this is that the greedy man is known to adopt a human physical form. He's not a weird wind or just something that exists in the sky that the Skull think is real. No, they claim to have seen and interacted with him. But who exactly is he? And also, I suppose equally mysterious, is who is the Allmaker if we know the divines of Tamriel are real too? There's a lot going on here, but not a lot that can fully, and especially not easily, be explained. And finally, last on our list, we have the curious case of the Atronach Forge. What is it doing, and who originally created it? Beneath the College of Winterhold lies an area referred to as the Midden. Few college staff and students know of this place's existence, and even fewer have ever dared enter its depths. In this damp series of cellars and tunnels, we'll find evidence of all sorts of horrifying acts. Skeletal remains litter the floors, and it seems dark rituals were once being performed down here, though at the bottom of this spooky basement, the Atronach Forge can be found, alongside a small series of notes, likely compiled long ago, also by someone who is likely long dead. The author of these diaries explains that the origins of the Atronach Forge are just as puzzling to him as anyone else. He doesn't know what the device is or how it came to be, though he does detail how it's possible to use it to summon various Atronachs, and even create Daedric armors, assuming you make the proper offerings and use it properly. And indeed, in the actual game, we ourselves can create all sorts of elite armor sets and conjure fire, ice, and storm Atronachs through the forge, assuming we use the right ingredients. So, what's going on here? Well, while how this structure came to be is definitely something to touch on, we in fact have a really good idea of how this thing works. At least, we think we do. As many of you already know, Atronachs, and even certain weapons, can be conjured up through the use of more general spells in normal gameplay, without the use of this forge. When you do this, conjure an ice Atronach or sword, you're not actually creating one out of thin air. Instead, and this is kinda cool, you're pulling that creature or item from the Plains of Oblivion into the Mortal Realm. There's some incredible lore behind this. Evidently, there are entire realms of Oblivion inhabited exclusively by Atronachs that we're pulling from. So, this forge is almost certainly doing a similar thing. It's not creating or forging anything itself, but instead just grabbing entities from Oblivion and putting them before us. Almost like a conduit between our two realms. But who built it? This is a far less straightforward question with a far less straightforward answer. 
It's old, really old, and almost certainly predates Nordic settlement in Skyrim. So, it most probably was an elven race. Either the Snow Elves, the Dwarves, or Chimer. The Chimer were basically ancestors of the Dark Elves, it's kinda weird. Parts of the Forge incorporate elements that appear to be very Dwemer in nature, making them a prime candidate. Though, the rest of the architecture in the Midden doesn't really suit their particular style. Could it be an ancient elven cult of Daedra worshippers, maybe? Mirabel Irvine states that the College of Winterhold, which is on top of this whole thing, was built sometime in the First Era. So it definitely predates that. Be it the Dwarves, Snow Elves, or Daedra themselves, hey that rhymes, I don't think we'll ever know for sure who constructed this thing. And that's why it earns a final spot in today's video. And with that, we are going to wrap up. Five more unsettling mysteries in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. Which of these mysteries or curious questions do you think you might have an explanation for? And which should I cover in a future video? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated, especially in 20 plus minute videos. Again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.